right? So we have to have a strong sense that there's going to be some sort of competition that eliminates this. And, and now, if that's eliminated, we see the red far out dwarfing the other three values right here. And here, this is not an option. All right? So that's one type of sensitivity analysis where we are looking specifically at the probabilities and asking the question, what if we're, we're not so sure? What if we're wrong? How wrong can we be before it's going to change our mind? Okay? The other type of sensitivity analysis, which I didn't have a chance to talk with on Wednesday, is not asking what if our probabilities are wrong, but asked a similar but related question, what if our understanding of the outcomes are wrong? So we're over or underestimating the value of what would happen if this state of nature took place. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to do a little bit of simplification here. Um, and and uh, I'm going to ask that same question of, of this problem right here. Um, if you look carefully at the decision tree, the, the probabilities um, for with competition or without competition look like are a um, x, 2x, 4x. Right? I need to make sure I have that right. They have that behavior. Um, so with competition, x, 2x, 4x, and then this is 2x, 4x, 8x. Okay? So what I'm going to assume is that we, and so this was 200, 400, 800, 400, 800, 1600. So what I'm going to assume is that this relationship holds true. That, that through, through history, we've seen that if we develop a, a game that, depending upon its demand, we roughly get this, this one, two, four behavior. Um, and, and so it's okay to, to write it as this x, 2x, 4x, 2x, 4x, 8x kind of, of behavior. But what we're a little bit less certain on is what the, the true outcome of this particular game is going to be. Sometimes we hit a home run uh, because we've just our creative juices are flowing and we just do do a good job of developing this the system. Sometimes it's kind of a dud, and and so we're uh, there's a, there's a range rather than a specific value that we should understand this to be. And so my question is now now what is the probability that the competition changes, but what values of x will make us change our mind? That we think that the Battle Pacific would be a better solution than, than the Space Pirates here. So um, I'm going to do the same, competition, uh, same computation for the expected value. Our expected value for, for this is going to be 60% um, times and now, again, I'm not changing the probabilities. So 30% uh, uh, of 4x plus 40% of 2x plus 30% of x. And those are the probabilities of each of these three taking place, plus 40% of, uh, <coughs> there's a 50% probability that we'll get 8x, plus a 30% probability that we'll get 4x, plus a 20% probability that we'll get 2x. Okay, and so our question is, at what point is this expected value going to change 
again, from being lower than that 640 expected value that we got from the Battle Pacific solution. How far off do we need to be? So again, we just multiply these values together and, and do, do our algebra. So this is 60% times um, 1.2x plus 0.8x plus 0.3x plus 40% times 4x plus 1.2x plus 0.4x. <clears throat> Uh, so that means 60% of 2.3x uh, plus 0.4x plus 0.3x plus 0.4x. I'm just multiplying these numbers together. So this is a prox, uh, this equals 1.38x plus 2.4x, which equals 3.62x. So what we're trying to ask is, when is 3.62x still larger than 640? And if we divide both sides by 3.62, we get that x needs to be larger then are equal to 176.7955. Yeah. So about 177. So as long as our, our low end value here remains above this, even if we're not exactly sure, if we can be pretty certain that, yeah, we're going to make at least $178,000, even in the worst case scenario where we have competition and we have low demand. If we can be pretty certain about that, then we know from our expected value perspective that we should continue to pursue the space pirate solution. But if, if, if it falls below this, now we actually have to think. Again, that doesn't mean we immediately change, but it says ah, our uncertainty leads us to maybe think a little bit longer <coughs> about whether or not we should or should not make this decision. It doesn't say we automatically change, because this is about uncertainty. It's not about we know this is going to happen, because if we knew it was going to happen, we would encode that originally into our decision tree. This is how certain are we about what we encode into our decision tree, and, and how does that inform the overall decision-making process. Okay. Again, I'm simplifying things here because I'm assuming this kind of behavior is going to hold. And maybe that maybe it's a little bit more complicated behavior than that. But you, you can get the basic idea. If you have some sort of relationship that you know is going to be true, uh, regardless of what your final outcomes are going to be, you can make a, a similar model, solve for, for those, those values, and, and get the solution. The part when it gets tricky again is just like what I hinted at with the other sensitivity analysis where I said, you know, what happens if we have more than two options and you can't just do one minus p? Well, what happens if you have more than two variables? You know, that kind of makes things more difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so you are making assumptions, you are simplifying things, but it gives you a little bit of insight uh, into what might happen, what, what the results might be. Questions about this uh, idea of sensitivity analysis? <clears throat> I believe, I forget, I don't have it written down here, that you will have a homework assignment that requires you to do sensitivity analysis. Maybe it's a problem. I forget. All right.
let's start a new chapter. Let's start a new topic then. All right. <clears throat> so I'll introduce it today, kind of give the idea of what we're doing, kind of look at uh, an example problem that, that we might encounter, um, but we probably won't completely solve that uh, today, and we'll come back on Monday and finish off wherever we leave. So we're, we're logically going from chapter 13 to chapter 14. Uh, and um, the idea here is that we're going to do what's called multi-criteria decision make or um, uh, multi-criteria uh, or goal-driven um, integer programs. So the idea here is that um, Oftentimes we don't just have, we're not just trying to satisfy one objective. That there are maybe primary and secondary objectives that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and so uh, maybe we can try to, to do them both. Um, but if not, can we get as close as, as possible so we're, we're, we're meeting as much of our objective as we can. Uh, uh, and so, the first thing we have to understand is some sort of priority of goals. This is more important to me than this. I need to, I need to make sure that this happens. And if I can make that happen, I'd like to make this other thing happen. And, and we can have any number of these goals. I, mean, I want to make this happen, and if we can't make that happen, then we'd like to make this happen. And if we can't make that, can we make this? And so forth. So I want to make as much profit as I can. Uh, but I'm a humanitarian, so I want to give, give uh, as high of salaries to my employees as possible. And if I can, then I would like to donate philanthropically to, you know, right? There's this hierarchy of, of objectives that, that we want to, to meet um, as an example. So if you can turn your book to problem 14.1, um, we have an example. Uh, that we can look at specifically. <coughs> My textbook, that's uh, page 691. Take just a minute or two to read this so that you're <coughs> familiar with what we're trying to do. You can see right there at the end it says goal one, goal two, right? So we've got more than one thing we're trying to satisfy. So the very first question that you're asked to respond to is, can we satisfy both of these goals? Okay? So let's, uh, let's figure out if, if we can. Um, so let's just make a, a simple table here, all right, um, where I'm going to make our, our goal. Here be our fuel or our solvent, and then I'm going to have our uh, materials. One, two, and three. All right. 
So, uh, make this a little bit more obvious. What is our goal? How much do we want to make for our fuel? How much fuel do we want to make? 30 tons? And how many tons of solvent do we want to make? 15. 15. Okay. So, and, uh, so, <clears throat> so what would be really helpful then for us uh, is to figure out um, how much we, we have on hand and how much we need. Okay, so how much do we have of material one? 20 tons. We have 20 tons. How much do we have of material two? Five. And how much do we have of material three? 21. Okay, so let, let's go ahead and compute these three values here by figuring out <coughs> For each one of these moles, how much we need of each material. Okay? So, if we want to produce 30 tons of fuel, how much of this material do we need right here? How much of material one do we need? How do you get that? I heard 12. 30 times 0.4 tons. Right, you, need, you have to use three fifths of a ton of this for each ton of that. So 30 times three fifths, or two fifths, sorry. So we need 12 tons of this material right here. How much do we need of material two? Yeah, say it louder. Don't. Zero. Zero, right? We don't use material two for to make fuel. And how much do we need of material three? three Thirty times three fifths, which is eighteen tons. Magically, eighteen plus twelve 30. is thirty. Yay! <coughs> Chemistry works, right? Conservation of mass. <coughs> All right. How about the solvent? How many tons of material one do we need? <coughs> we want 15, and we multiply that by... How many tons of material one do we need for solvent? 1 half, right? So this is 7 and a half. So I'll pause here for a second. We now know how much we need for material one overall, right? We need 12 tons here. We need seven and a half tons here for a total of 19 and a half tons. All right, good. We have enough of that material on hand. Let's keep going. Material two, how much do we need of material two? How much tons do we, of material two do we use for each solvent? Say it louder. One fifth. One fifth. Three. So we need a total of three tons. Two down, one to go, right? All right. So how much do we need here? Fifteen. Three ten. Which is. Okay, so this is an example where we're trying to achieve two goals, but we're not going to be able to achieve it. We can already calculate this, and so now we want to figure out how do we approach this situation? How do we decide what we're going to do? All right? Is everyone with me on, on how we're going to, to do this? So now what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a new type of a constraint or a new type of um, uh, equation that tries to embody the fact that sometimes we can't make the goal. So 
our, our goal for the, for the fuel is, is that we, we make 30 tons. But sometimes <clears throat> we might not make enough. We might be short of, of our goal. Uh, so we're going to have to add <coughs> our, this is what's called a deviation variable, how far away we are from our goal. Um, and this specifically is our deviation getting below our goal. Uh, and it's for the fuel goal. Okay, so it's got both a superscript and a subscript. This is the deviation for the fuel that is below our goal. We could also end up making too much, in theory. So this is the, the full equation. We have our goal there. We might fall below it. We might go above it. Uh, if we add where we fell below, we would get to our goal. Or if we subtract it going over, we would get exactly to our goal. And so we do a, a similar thing with our solvent. Um, and so we have our deviation for our solvent as well. <clears throat> okay, so these can be um, these can be the the equations that that we're going to specifically. we're going to add to represent achieving more than one goal here. We're still going to have the same type of equations that you would have expected if, if I asked you this with just try to use the, the least amount of material as possible or some, some other optimization. Right? So <clears throat> we're going to have something like uh, 2 fifths F um, plus 1 half S has to be equal to less than or equal to 20. What is that representing? What is that equation representing? Material 1. Right? 2 fifths of material 1, 1 half of material 1. And that has to be less than what we have <coughs> in material 1. What's the next constraint then that we're going to have? What's the constraint going to be for material 2? It's going to be 1 fifth S has to be and then what's our, our third material constraint going to be right here? It's going to be 3 fifths F plus 3 tenths S has to be less than or equal to 21. We really can't violate those laws of nature very well, right? So our solution has to embody that. So F and S are how much we make of each of our two goals, our fuel 